Thank you. As you can tell, Elias is in the office today and doesn't have the luxury of having a private office, so he has his mask on. <laughs> Aaron, can you post the agenda in the chat so uh, I don't have to dig through all my stuff here? A link to it? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see. There you go. Thank you, sir. So Wolfram had said he would not be able to make it. So I'll go ahead and note him on the roll here. Tomiko, I saw coming in, Sarah. Morning, everybody. Is it okay if I leave my camera off until you need me? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, we'll you. call you when, when we get there. Beautiful. Thank you. So I think we have all of the board members in attendance. I see Heather just joined us. So I say we call the meeting to order at 10 02. All right. Well done, sir. Uh, meeting call to order. Uh, we are recording the meeting. I think that everybody saw that as you uh, logged in. So uh, be aware of that. Um, and then, Charlie, thinking? just real quick before we kick it off, the uh, city clerk's office has sent me some information that I guess the city has adopted a new code of conduct policy for all boards, commissions in city council meeting. So I have a little blurb to read to kind of kick us off this morning. Please do. Before we begin, I want to remind the downtown parking board members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct at meetings. This includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the board members or staff. All members of the downtown parking board, staff, and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting may result in removal from the meeting. This meeting of the downtown parking board will now come to order. I've already taken a uh, roll. And that so was directed that... towards Henry. Is that how that came about? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds lot. inappropriate comment there to start. <laughs> Um, Arian, can I ask, is, I'm not seeing it at the bottom, but is the, um, transcription? Uh, it's probably not activated. Activated. Let's see. Live transcript. Ready? Enable. There we go. It should start coming through. Thank you. All right. So before we get into uh, the rest of our agenda here, we'll uh, start out with open forum. And I believe uh, Blair I'm wants not. to uh, speak here. Blair, uh, you're up first. Uh, you are on the clock with two minutes. Hi. Thank you. Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. Um, I guess, you know, uh, my, my role in San Jose for like the past seven years has been to politely sit at public comment time and, and speak on the wonders of uh, the ACLU ideas of accountability uh, and openness with the future of surveillance technology. It's a pretty remarkable piece of work. Uh, you know, it sets a series of guidelines and legal precedents. Um, 
that can really, it is meant to get us out of the era of 9-11 and war and work towards the ideas of community, open democracy and ideas of peace. And I, I'm, I'm just learning a lot. I think, you know, it, the actions in, in Russia at this time look silly <laughs> in working towards ideas of peace and open democracy that a community can develop together that the ACLU guidelines offer a lot of help with. You're working with ideas of new AI technology. Uh, it needs good civil protection practices and, and guidance that uh, if we learn these sort of steps and practices, we won't be in that continual confusion and fog of war and era of 9-11 and, and we'll be more upright and bright and, and just make better decisions. And that's the innovation and that's the hope for the community that uh, I think can be important to downtown uh, San Jose commerce groups and such and how and how you invite people to San Jose in the future. So good luck uh, in, in working on all these efforts, the AI issues, the surveillance technology issues and how open public policies can really help define our good democratic future and community. Thank you. Blair, thank you very much for your yeah. comments and uh, you know, nice piece, well done. Uh, next up, uh, Bill, uh, do you want to uh, have your piece as well? Bill, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. I see that the topic that we talked about in October is actually agendized uh, this time. So I'm not sure when I should speak, but I'm basically here uh, to, I think, get follow up and uh, final decision on residential permitting downtown for uh, metered street parking. So uh, I have added some suggestions before. One of the things I'd like to add is that uh, where I live as a, as a homeowner, uh, I pay PBID every year. And there was some discussion about how difficult Heather was explaining how difficult it would be to figure this out. But if we've got a car registered to a, an address that is a P-bid paying resident, maybe that would simplify things. All I'm looking for is a way for me to park my car in front of my uh, condo on a regular basis, just like other residential parking permits allow for all around the downtown area. I'll stop there and if there's conversation during that agendized part that I can contribute to, I would appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And yeah, we'll uh, you know, bring you back in you know, when we get to item six here. I think that uh, absolutely is appropriate. Uh, any other uh, comments here? Uh, okay, uh, so with that, let's go to the consent calendar. Blair, if you could put your hair, hand down, uh, I believe that's uh, from uh, from before. That would be uh, just helpful for uh, you know, running the meeting. The uh, consent calendar, everybody's seen the minutes. Uh, any comments, changes on the minutes that we have? Move approval. Second. Who was that? I'm sorry, that was Henry? Yeah. Henry, yeah. Tomiko is uh, your second. Any discussion, anything there? Okay, so uh, that's part of the consent file. So uh, uh, we don't need to vote there, uh, correct guys? So uh, <clears throat> if there's no changes. Yep. So general business update, uh, mid-year review. Uh, Arian, is that, uh, are you taking that one or is you I will. that to, okay. Yep, I'll pull it up, I'll share screen. Let's see. Let's see. Can you see? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I think what has worked in the past is that I'll go through the narrative piece and actually show the, the financials. If that works. So what we're looking at in this table here is our last year's actuals 2021, our current 21 22 modified budget and the mid-year actuals and then the variance and we're looking for a percentage to be 
around 50% would be a target that we're shooting for. And we can talk about any deviation significant from that. So the modified budget is 12.12 million. That was increased from our earlier uh, projected budget for the year. And we've increased that by $4.14 million due to higher than expected parking activity. And just the return of uh, some events downtown, the arena, some spattering of conventions and concerts. And so we've seen an increase. So we bumped up our revenue budget to 12.12 million. At mid-year, we're at 6.3 million or 52% of the budget here. Uh, facility and meters are tracking just over 50% at 52 and 53%. Um, we're cautiously optimistic that our second half will continue to track in this way um, as we kind of continue to transition out of the pandemic, hopefully, start seeing bigger crowds downtown returning to offices, hitting up restaurants and bars and events. Um, additionally, as part of the proposed budget, we had previously included a $4.9 million transfer in to the parking fund from our capital fund. Uh, you can see last year we transferred in 5.7 million to offset the lack of revenue. Uh, this year we have now eliminated that $4.9 million kind of infusion as we see the increased revenues coming in. So that's a, that's a positive. Operating expenditures, 5.26 million or 49% of our budget. Uh, our proposed operating expenditures were earlier in the year 11.8 million. We've reduced that by 1 million down to 10.8 uh, just due to lower contractual service costs, primarily with our parking operator. Uh, we haven't, it's been a kind of a dual sided piece of that in that they're struggling to hire people for some current vacancies. And we don't, weren't trying to bring back as many staff as pre-pandemic, obviously, with the, the lack of events and such. And the change kind of in our business model of having staff sitting in booths at every garage. And instead, we we're transitioning to remotely managing these facilities from one call center downtown in our garages. Um, the police sec security detail, this line here, we actually did increase that though from 150,000 to 320,000 uh, to try and combat the ongoing uh, vehicle vandalisms, loitering uh, and transient activity. Um, and so we bumped that up, that facilitates overtime for police officers to work a specific beat that patrols our lots and garages downtown. Uh, the biggest decline is obviously, like I mentioned, the DOT contractual services. This is mostly coming from our parking operator um, being understaffed for some management roles and office staff. Um, and then just obviously not bringing back as many staff for events. Total transfers are at 100% of the year. That always happens early in the year, these various transfers out. Um, so that is done for the year. Our net revenue is $55,000. Um, so that's the, that's the nuts of the nuts and bolts of the parking fund side. I'll go into the capital, but I wanted to pause for a second to see if there were any questions there. So Arian, wh wh when did the budget get modified? And is there a document that shows the bridge and the rationale. I know you just walked us through that, but is that uh, something that uh, is shared publicly? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the modified budget is a formal city process timing wise. Gosh, I do not know the specific timeline of when that was done. Actually, I think it's just in the probably February time. Heather, do you happen to know what the exact timeline of that was? Yes, earlier in the month, or yeah, last month, early, I guess now we're not. Yeah, we're in March, earlier in so, February, yeah. so just prior to kind of publishing all this, the, the modified budget's getting kind of buttoned up on the city side. 
but yeah, so there's the proposed budget, then the modified budget, then there's some like cleanup actions in the spring and then they kind of close out the year. And this is how we present it to the board is we present the proposed budget, then we come back with our mid-year and in that mid-year kind of recap, we show you what the modified budget and what changes have, have been made there. So working with the budget office, you know, the big changes that we made here were to eliminate the transfer in of 4.9 million to eliminate that and then to reduce our operating expenditures downward. This, and, the, um, and the revenue side was bumped up. Yeah, and, and typically, you know, non, in non COVID impacted, here's our modified budget stays fairly true. Um, we don't have a lot of swings um, in that, in that um, process, but because of the COVID, of COVID and our, our differential and how we're estimating and not knowing how it's going to play out long-term, um, this is, I think, one of the first years that we've seen a significant kind of change in modified. Um, of course, we had that last year as well, but it's not a, it's, I would say it's atypical for the parking fund to really have a ton of changes um, in the modified. Yeah, I think the last couple of years. I did have a couple of notes relative to kind of revenue and expenses. So currently we're at $6.3 million in revenue. Last year, we were at this time, mid-year, we were about 3 million. And in a pre-COVID year, we were at about 9 million. And then on the expense side of things, last year, we were at 5.9 million in expenses. That was mostly due to our city overhead, which is just a kind of dictated amount. It was actually higher over here. But then in pre-COVID years, this number, or pre-2019-20 year, was 6.5 million, so 1.3 million higher um, in that pre-COVID year. So just kind of a putting into perspective where we are and where we've come from and, and the like. So if you scroll down on the page, um, so what was the net change in the original budget? Uh, Let's see. Well, we um, if I could just back into it, we had four million less in revenue, but four point nine million in the transfer infusion. Let's call it so. That's a round up to a million positive, but then we decreased the expenses by a million. Uh, so I'm guessing it was very close to this, but now it's just not requiring the the infusion in. Okay. Thank you. Have, I don't have it directly in front of me. That, 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 that's close enough for what I was trying to do. If anybody yeah. else has any comments. I think we just balance the, balance the numbers by, okay, we don't need the infusion. We already see the revenue coming upward and we can cut down the expense line. Um, next would be the facility uh, revenue and expense kind of very, very high level look there. Um, the Market Street Garage is, is leading the sites, not surprisingly with the lack of uh, convention center events, but you can see that even without events, but the convention center is the only facility that does not have the 90 minutes of free parking, that it, it increases the revenue stream pretty significantly there. Um, Fourth and San Fernando, with the lack of San Jose State students in big numbers coming to campus, hopefully we see that change. Uh, that should move upward. There's our there's our revenue, the on-street meters through mid-year, 1.3 million. And a rough look at the, the operating income by location. Uh, I think we've talked about this before. These are a lot of allocated expenditures based on percentages that are imperfect, but it gives us a little bit of a sense of where things are. Arian, can I ask the dumbest question of all? Uh, what, sure. So the fiscal year is July 1 to June 30th? Yes. 
And this period mid-year is from July 1 to December 31st? Yes. Okay. And that's six months? Correct. Okay. I appreciate the addition of the percentages, which was, I think, David's idea. That was David's really idea. Like We've done it for the last handful of meetings. And yeah, yeah. it's, a, it's a yeah. welcome. <laughs> Um, if there's nothing else there, this is the, the capital. Uh, let me see if I can knock that down. Is that still okay? Yep. Or for it a little bigger. So the modified budget for the uh, capital, $25 million. Um, the largest amount being in the uh, Parking inventory line. This is for property purchases and uh, development of parking, predominantly in the Deridon area. We've talked about Lot E as a site in the past, and the city's real estate department is continually uh, trying to purchase properties on that land to further the development of parking for the Deridon area and the arena. Um, the revenue control project, which has been going on for several years, we're in the tail end of that, hopefully moving towards our acceptance testing phase, but all of that money still sits in that line. And then we have the Market Street Garage facade, which is the replacement of the tile facade at the Market Street Garage. Um, and then elevator projects, which the city's public works department is in the process of putting together a bid package to upgrade and modernize several elevators across the portfolio. Um, but you can see actual expenditures against that $25 million is only 430,000. Um, things like the garage, the elevators, for example, Public Works is charging as they go uh, some of their incremental time to develop those bid packages, but such time as we actually start really moving forward. Um, so, Arian, has the modified budget changed from the original budget very much? Modified budget on capital. Let's see. Do we have? Let me see if I've got the proposed in front of me. If I can pull it out of one of these. Uh, prior reports sitting here. S item 60 in September, we had the proposed budget and the proposed capital budget for 21-22 would have been $22 million. With uh, so slightly, yes. I don't have the exact number changes. Uh, I'm looking at it, trying to see if there's any numbers that are jumping out at me that would have significantly increased. So Aaron, you know, from now on uh, going forward here, it, it would be helpful for me, and I assume for the rest of the board, if you just did a bridge for everybody on you know budget to modified budget and then then talked about all this is wonderful that you have, but it just, to me, it level sets us of where we're starting from. And yeah. I mean, over the year, we've tried to minimize the number of columns on this, but you're basically asking for the proposed budget column to be here, then the modified, and then these remaining. Or, or, or even just a separate page that just does the bridge because I'd like to see budget, modified budget, variance, and explanation. So that way we understand what changed, why it changed. Yeah. And then you can go into this uh, and, and throw out the old budget and just do modified budget versus how we're doing against it. Okay. We can, we can work towards something there. Because my, my fear, again, public meeting and everything is just, things get changed or potentially things get changed from a budget to a modified budget and 
that's when things get slipped in or sneaked in or slipped in or, you know, uh, stuff happens and people wouldn't have noticed as much. And so I, I just think we want to disclose that. Just I'm not accusing anyone of doing anything inappropriate here. Uh, but yeah, I just in, the, in the operating budget, yeah, in the operating budget, we called out all the significant ads or deletions, uh, like the transfers, the increased revenue, and the reduction in operating. Um, I can I can work to towards better illustrating those similar type of impacts on the capital side. Appreciate that. Thank you. If any board members disagree with that, let me know because uh, I can always stand to be corrected. Oh, I think right. I've made a note there. Um, but just to recap, the the expenditures are are low. We've been due to staffing challenges on our own side. My lead engineer on our team is is vacant. He's moved on to a different uh, division within DOT. So moving any of these projects, as well as just delays in other projects like the facade uh, project, the city had uh, been working towards a new um, contract for surveillance cameras, which would include upgrading all the cameras in our garages. Um, I guess they did not get great responses back. And so they're tightening up that RFP and likely going back out, they had anticipated that we'd have a contract awarded before the end of this year. It doesn't look like that's gonna happen now. Um, the parking inventory is land acquisition, presumably can take quite a bit of time in any development. So we'll continue to see these numbers, um, like even this, we've encumbered lots of monies in the uh, revenue control that project will be done at the end of this fiscal year and then hopefully starts to drop off. The others are likely to continue on for some time and we'll be carrying those monies over to subsequent years in the event they don't, aren't completed in this fiscal year. Holly, could I have a question? Yeah. Um, and it's really uh, to, to Arian, but, you know, like these major expenditures we had, but are not expending them for facade improvements and garage elevator upgrades. I know public works is busy. Why wouldn't we consider outsourcing these items? I don't, I don't have, we don't have the luxury of outsourcing them. They're, they're public works projects and under their purview. Well, would public works outsource? Well, I mean, ultimately, much of what Public Works ultimately does, I mean, it isn't, they aren't going to physically fix these elevators. They're going to develop the, the scope of work, the engineering, bid them out. And in many cases, even that work then is subbed out to consultants. So it's a, it's a yes and a no, but Public Works is the lead. I don't mean to throw them under the bus and that they are delaying these projects. I don't think that's necessarily the case. It's just these projects take time to develop the scopes. We put money on the table through our budget process. And in many cases, because these aren't us doing the work, Public Works doesn't even get it in their hopper of work product until we get the budget approved. So in that case, we're already a little bit behind. And once they get it in their queue and start chewing on it, then we're already midway through the year. Once they get the specs and drawings done, we're probably getting towards the tail end of the year. And, and then that money then is necessary to move forward to the following year where the project actually starts to get some traction and we start spending. Yeah, I, I'm not uh, criticizing anybody. Uh, I'm just looking for a way that if the elevators need to be upgraded and facades improved, uh, we're sitting on probably the third year in our budget, knowing that. So I just don't see the progress, you yeah. know. Yeah, so the facade is one in, in particular that has, has changed over the last handful of years, even pre-pandemic, where we had anticipated originally using the money just for some art enhancements to the facade. Then we determined through that process and kind of just investigating what was out there that the existing facade needed to be 
repaired at a minimum, and then it was found that that needed to be replaced. So that energized a whole new level of a project to replace that. And so now the public works team has engaged consultants to come up with the remediation plan to remove all of that tile to then set us up for the replacement of the facade with that artistic treatment that I think we shared probably a year ago at this point. There's, do you, there's, do you, do you um, get updates from public works? Oh yeah, we meet with them regularly on these on these projects. Okay. Yep. We just did a site walk on the facade with both the consultant and the engineering consultant that's doing the demo package to actually take off the existing tile and the consultant, the engineer for the art installation. So that just happened probably three weeks ago um, to, to move that forward. And then okay. Public Works is in the in process of the design phase of the elevator repair project, and that's citywide. So this is a big project for them that includes elevators and all properties. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a good point, Arian, is on a lot of these or some of these projects, we're not the only player in the game. For example, the elevators, that project is tied into all the elevators in the city. So there's a main contract for all the elevators and all the buildings that is overseen by Public Works. It's the same thing with the security improvements, the cameras that we we're talking about, security cameras. The city is going out for an entire RFP on all the security cameras. So the ones at the airport, the ones in our garages, the ones in, um, you know, treatment plants, water treatment facilities, all the cameras together. So sometimes these projects are, we're part of a, a whole. And so we have even kind of less control over the timelines in our, um, have to, have to abide by the, the greater whole, which can delay us. <laughs> free so, us up free us up <laughs> we try that on a regular basis <laughs> we, we get pretty good but of finding ways to kind of expedite and check chisel out just our portions I um, sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't <laughs> if there's nothing else on 5a this is a action item it's an approval item I could get a motion in a second. Motion. A second. I'll second it. Henry. With, uh, with Charlie's uh, request that yep. in the initial budget. Yep, I've got that noted for the capital side. Okay, thanks. Uh, any All opposed? Favor, guys. Yep. Okay, unanimous vote. Very good. Thank you. Up I next, Aaron. 5B is the proposed budget. So this is the, the first uh, take at the 22-23 proposed budget. Uh, we will bring it back for final approval, but this is the prelim uh, in our June meeting. Yeah, see, this is, is the part, Arian, that, that bothers me or concerns me, right? Is sure we're asked as a board to approve a budget, but we're not asked to approve a modified budget. Uh, I guess that's really where I was going with my questions is all of a sudden a modified budgets given to this board yeah. um, that we had no say in no, and I'm not saying anything's wrong, but it's just, it, the, the process to me is odd. I don't know that the timing of the meetings would We can have meetings anytime we want to have meetings. So that, that, that's. Well, I understand. I, I'm just articulating that the way we have, the way the board has operated for as long as I've been a part of it, the board has not been involved in the approval process of the modified budget. We can take that under, you know, under consideration, and I'll I'll talk to my my leadership and the budget office and see what the what the thoughts are around, you know, any further working board input into that 
element of the budget. Yeah, because the odd part is, and I believe when when you go back and look at history, all right, and you look at you know the 2019 or the you know 2015 budget, right? <laughs> The only thing that's ever going to show in any records is going to be, I believe, the modified budget, right? The final budget that you had for the year. And if this group is never approving that, that's what we're managing to. That's what, you know, people are looking at us uh, as managing to. So it, it just, it seems odd. Okay. It's noted. And uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> talk about that and circle back. Thank you. Just as a question on that, yeah, this is, we've had a couple of odd years, but if you were to eliminate the odd years, how, what, what's the delta between the original budget and the modified budget during a normal year, like 16, 17, 18, or 19? Is That's it a, a lot or a little? David. Yeah. It's, it's a little, like I mentioned earlier, this is a, a unique scenario these last couple of years where there's been significant changes um, and unknowns. Um, for the most part, uh, it's been fairly consistent. Our, our proposed ends up matching our modified uh, to the most, almost to the T. There are some variations, of course, with the vacancy savings, or if we have, you know, projects that accelerate or, or decelerate or change. But for the most part, it's fairly stable. Um, and, uh, you know, we went from a uh, parking board used to meet on a more frequent basis um, years ago. And then that board decided, you know, we moved to the quarterly meeting. So, I mean, it's based on the, the board's desire and, um, you know, staffing resources and whatnot. I mean, we can make changes. It's just, it's, you know, modified. These, these documents have been modified to um, the preference of the board and how they want to see it. So, we're so, happy to take the feedback so, so and, and Heather, it it's maybe. Laura, just want to weigh in. Um, we would need to check, as Arian suggested, with the administration because there were efforts many years ago to look at all of the boards in the city and many of the boards and commissions, with the exception of a few, like the Planning Commission, moved to quarterly meetings. So we would, you know, hear the desire, but we would need to check on, on how, how a potential additional meeting to fold in the mid-year budget could be accommodated. And I think this goes back to David's, you know, comment, which I thought was, you know, spot on. You know, if, if this is a COVID anomaly, then, okay, you know, we adjust and we figure that stuff out. And, and if, if the norm is to you know, not change things around very much, then, you know, I, I, maybe we don't have any issue here at all. Um, I, what I've been taking exception to here, uh, you know, during the meeting is just the charts were presented and it was, you know, kind of like, okay, here's the modified budget. There was no bridge. Uh, Arian provided it verbally, which was wonderful, but, you know, it, to me, the record needs to show what changed from this to that. And, and, and that just needs to be out there in a, in a public way. That's all. So, so basically, uh, Charlie, I think what you're asking is, would you have another column with the original budget? Or alternatively, if you had a little tiny column that said what the percentage change is across the big items, like total revenue. Uh, or, or just like I, what I suggest, just a separate chart, you know, that's a standalone yeah. that, because, and if every year it becomes, it's, it's a non-factor because it's right. a 2% change as Laura, you know, I think it was Laura that said, then, then so be it, you know, that, that, that's not a big deal, but it's completely transparent on what we approved versus what we're measuring ourselves against. Okay, sorry, Ari, we'll, we'll, we'll let you try to finish here. No problem. So this is the proposal. We got the modified budget that we just went over, our mid-year actuals, and now the 22-23 proposed budget. So we are optimistic and cautiously so that our revenues will continue to increase. And we've, we've put those at 15% for next year, 15% increase. Uh, we are not 
proposing any transfers in next year. So we don't need any propping up from the capital side. So what's the percentage this year? And you kind of alluded to it a couple of charts ago, but uh, you know, utilization of the garages, where are we at today? 50% utilized or 60% utilized that, you know, 30% utilized probably uh, versus this is assuming that we're at 50%. Right? So I'm looking for what the utilization numbers are, how they're different here. So this is not necessarily based on a, a percentage of utilization as much as it's uh, forecasting increases in, I guess it's it, six of one, half dozen another, increased revenue would translate to increased occupancy, but it isn't based on a occupancy percentage. Well, it has to be. You're not increasing price, so it has to be utilization. That's the only other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we have looked at that and we are anticipating the return of our monthly parkers, not in mass, not in 100 percent. This number in a pre-COVID year would have been 14 to 15 million. Uh, the parking meters would have been closer to 4 million. Uh, and so we are what it, I think 60% revenue here or something like that. And we're jumping it up to another 15% above that. Um, and with the return of the convention center will be another big one. Uh, and so that, that is the percentage, the 15%. Okay. Does that get you there? Because currently, yes, thank our you. garages across range from, I think you're probably fairly accurate that some are in the 30 to 40 range. And then others like the Market Street Garage are probably closer to the 50%. Um, and then of course there's the peaks and the valleys uh, as we've navigated the last six months of this year. Uh, so, so if you put this up against Team San Jose's budget, that I assume that there's some parallel process that they're working on um, that, that I know you're not involved in, but if, but if you went to team San Jose and looked at the convention business has been 2% or 10%, right? It, it's been nothing. Yep. Um, but next year they're expecting it to be back or 50% or whatever it is. I'm just trying to make sure there's a correlation between stuff that we know Right. Team San Jose is part of the city. Yep. Um, and, and so, you know, and it, it is one garage. Right. But it, it, it impacts some other things. I, I, are, are we looking at that level of data? Yeah. So we work with Team San Jose to try and glean as much as we can from the information that they're able to share with us relative to activity. I think they're super conservatively planning uh, as their budget process was being born out of the the darker ages of this year uh, in earnest, you know, we were all working on our, on our budgets in that November, December timeline when things were looking more bleak than they are today. Um, so they were admittedly, I think, fairly conservative in the return. Um, so that does play into some of this look ahead for, for next year for us in terms of that specific facility. The remaining other facilities in the portfolio have, were, were pushing more for the return of the office worker to be the, the bigger piece that we see bolstering the revenues. But Team San Jose's activity, you know, is is hard is is difficult for us because they don't they don't necessarily give us a here's our schedule for month by month, event by event. They give us some high level looks of numbers of events at a very, very high level, and then attendee levels. And those are very squishy for us to try to really glean any uh, information on parking data, especially when we're talking about a garage of 600 publicly available spaces. You know, they could tell us there's 10,000 people coming. Well, it's still 600 people that are going to park for that event. And they could tell us there's a 300 person event coming and we might also fill up that day just from exterior influence things and that event. The point is just between 
Convis, right? Um, the, uh, you know, Nathan's here from uh, the Downtown Association, uh, the San Jose Sports Authority, um, you know, some other, you know, entities that are driving events. If all of them, and I'm not sure any of them, <laughs> but all of them are saying they're expecting a 50% increase in activity year over year, then a 15% increase on our part might be too conservative. I, I just think you need to check those boxes to say, and, and everybody has different mechanisms of planning. So, you know, there's no right answer here. So I, I, I agree, there isn't a right answer, but there's checkoffs that you can do um, to make sure that you've asked the usual suspects of who drives parking in the downtown. Right. So if Adobe has announced that they're not coming back, well, I don't know if that matters because they're not parking in any of your garages anyway. Right. But if, you know, uh, some other entity that drives and I don't know who those are. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't know that we, yeah, we don't have those. The convention center is obviously one that drives to a very specific location at a granular level. Uh, obviously the arena drives broader traffic to downtown and our market street garage specifically. So, you know, we obviously have that on our radar. Um, looking at just the, the return of outdoor special events is something. And so we're starting to see those hit the calendar uh, more frequently. And those are your just runs and races, but that's just a barometer that we're using as we kind of just look at, well, if those are coming back, that means more people are comfortable coming in more larger crowds. So how does that influence our thoughts? But I think the, the, the only commonality for the last two years is that we've been wrong every time we've tried to do this exercise. <laughs> um, and so 15% admittedly, is it scientific in any great detail? No. Yeah. So rotary would be another perfect example, right? Yep. right? They clog up the fourth street garage. If they're not coming back, you know, it's but they fun. validate for parking and we don't generate a whole lot of money from that. So that's another one. That, but but, yeah. but it's the sign of people yeah. coming back. If yeah, and coming back. absolutely, we've yeah. we've that is on our you know on our thermometer for you know what could impact our San Jose State. You know, I bumped into a couple of students at Lee's Sandwich a month or two ago, and I was in the office. I just happened to ask them what what's their schedule looking like for the spring semester. What were they anticipating? Just so I could try and glean how many of their peers would be driving back to campus, and you know they thought that they would have been back in class more frequently in the fall semester than they actually were. Uh, and they were hoping, but at the time they weren't really aware of what they had in store. So. Right. Lack of information is the. Uh, <laughs> yep. I agree. But, but, it, but you put your assumptions out and you put who you've checked off with out. Yes. Um, and, and at least that way we know um, you've checked off with the appropriate parking bodies around, you know, the parkers. I appreciate that. And uh, we can work to, to articulate that a little bit better. From an expense side of things, uh, given the, uh, the lack of information, uh, most of our expenditure lines are kind of back to, we had reduced them in our modified budgets. We had driven them down, I think a million or more dollars. Uh, so those are now bumping back up to their full amounts plus a couple percentages just for the increases. Um, we will likely make some modified adjustments in those years in the event that things are trending uh, either with staff vacancies or operator uh, contracts are not expending at their full amounts. But from a budget perspective and in working with our budget office, the, the, the direction we took was to basically budget them at 100% and make adjustments from there as we move through the next year. So that's the, the operating expenditure sides. Um, the transfers in the next year, the only significant change is that we do not have the ice rink improvement line here for the outdoor ice rink, which we have contributed 100,000 to. Uh, so that's down. And then we are, back to instead of taking a transfer into our operating fund from our capital, we're actually going to be putting in $1.7 million 
from the operating side into the capital. Arian, yeah. why isn't the ice rink in this budget? It's not an annual thing. It's not, this was a, a repair request from the downtown association on the, the ice rink. It was, it was a one-time funding necessary to, I guess, do some repairs to the ice rink to make it ready. So it, it wasn't a, an ongoing expenditure. Well, I'd like Nathan to look into that because I still think you need to make the improvements every year. That was a mayor's budget direction. So those usually come through um, the mayor's budget process. Yeah, I know he doesn't skate. <laughs> so, Arian, I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of questions for me today. Apologize. Okay. No, um, so the revenues are going up 15%. Right. And we're talking about, you know, however, whatever reasons that are, uh, that that's going to go up. It's, you know, additional parkers or those type of things. Yep. But the expenses are going up 20 plus percent. Right. I guess and, only off of the reduced amount that we've reduced them by. Yes. So we've reduced them in this year due to the factors that we talked about earlier from the operator side but we are now bringing them back to their kind of pre lowered funded levels from a budget perspective the direction was don't reduce them prematurely budget them at this at your kind of full full amount if you will and then we can reduce them in the mid year if that is the direction that the the fund is looking at but why not all do that with the revenue as well do that with the revenue budget them lower and then increase them why wouldn't everything be at 15 percent growth or 23 percent growth right versus having that eight percent difference uh i don't know that i can argue with the the rationale that you're bringing to the table a lot of this is coming from the budget office and the direction to, to me and I do budgeting for a living, right? But yep. your assumptions need to be consistent. And it seems like we have, we're going to slow play the revenue, but we're going to allow more expenses. And any normal business, you would try to grow those at the same rate. Now, maybe you're making a bet on increasing your expenses and then hoping there's a delay that there's a, a raise in the revenue later, but I'm not hearing that. Right. And, and so to me, it's, we're going back to business as usual or, or, or getting closer to business as usual on the expense side, but the, the revenues are lagging and I'm just saying there should be a correlation. I guess it's a, uh, and I, I hear you and these are the, similar to the conversations that we have internally, you know, amongst the, the various teams is, are these same types of what approach should we take? And I think the, the, where we landed or where the city has landed on this budget is that it is easier to have the flexibility in reducing costs throughout the year with the money at hand versus the office. And I, I understand that if it were my own, <laughs> my own household budget, that's not how, how it works. Well, and that's how we should be managing things, how we <laughs> do, do, do things on our own, because that, that's kind of the, in, in my world, the bellwether. You know, of, I, the other thing is the, the specific to contractual, the largest line item in this whole thing is our DOT contractual and the non-personal line, the 7.7 .7 million there. Most of that is contract based. So my operator, my parking operator, I'll round it, probably has roughly $4 million a year in the contract. And that's what the budget is based on. What is each contract's value and what is it that you have? And then as we go through the year, that's been adjusted. I, I can appreciate the, the feedback. 
<clears throat> the direction that the city, you know, and I'll, I'll say it at a higher level because I think it's bigger than just this one fund is that the expense side of things for our fund in particular, as it relates to these was to establish the, the contract bases in most of these cases for this, this line item in particular. And then as we move through the year, obviously we're, we're always managing those expenditure line items in an effort to reduce costs where, where it makes sense to do so. Um, and if there yeah, are savings. And I'll try to make this my last comment, guys. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it, the way I look at things as well is the revenues that we're taking in, right? The 13.9 million, right? That, that's forecasted here in the proposed budget you know, exceed the $15 million, is, excuse me, it's less than the um, expenditures of 15 million. And that's not a going concern way of running your business, right? You, you want to make sure your operating funds are balanced as best as you can, and you're not digging into your fund balance. Now, the past two years, we needed to dig into our fund balance because, you know, We've had horrific times with with uh, the pandemic and everything, but you know when we're coming out of the pandemic, I think you want to have a balanced budget. And frankly, what our objective here should be at a minimum is to balance our budget, and then at some point we need to be put, putting money away for that next rainy day that we're going to have. <clears throat> And maybe that's increased expenses of Deardon area real estate purchases or those type of things, right? That that's what we need to be building our balances back up to. And, and that is where we're starting to put funding in the out years. So as we look at the capital side of things, the, the transfer from the operating into the capital hits right there this first year. And then we anticipate putting in another $4 million in the out years. Hopefully that number grows, but we're hoping to then start putting more and more money back into the capital side of things. So Charlie, if that was your last question, I had one more. <laughs> um, Thank you. Where do we go from here if we don't have another, um, Op opportunity to change this proposed budget if we don't uh, if we don't do it today because it's going to go into the mayor's uh, the city budget for the next fiscal year right yeah we we bring the the final budget to the parking board at our june meeting which will include the the 22 23 budget and the five-year cip but you would have already given it to finance to complete the city budget, which has to be done in June. So it has to be prepared well before then. Yeah, I, uh, Laura or Heather from a timing perspective, feedback at the June the the city manager's budget proposed budget comes out early may i think it's may one if not close to that wow. and then after that there are a series of council budget study sessions and the mayor's budget proposed june budget message comes out probably for discussion early june um so, um, you know, unless there is a significant issue that needs to be addressed within the city manager's proposed budget, um, it's rare that that changes are made at that point in time. And again, unless there is something very significant that has happened. There's always reconciliation of of expenditures that have happened through through the spring, um, that is that is adjusted, but um, typically not major pr proposal changes. Yeah. So uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, this is our last uh, shot at at uh, 
next year's budget. Uh, yes. Yeah. And maybe just to, to expand on, um, you know, what Arian was, was sharing, um, you know, on the expense side, um, it is. I need to call you back. You know, reducing the expenses to match the revenues. I mean, it's not necessarily a one to one. And if there is a need to increase the expenses, whether it's mid year or in between, then that is an official budget action that would need to be taken at council together with the budget office. And so um, I think as Erin was, was alluding to earlier, there it's, you know, providing the budget for, for um, you know, a robust program. And we've always, the team has always, you know, had an eye on reducing expenses wherever as possible. But for example, we don't wanna go in and shave, you know, 15% off of security or 50%, 15% off of lighting and say, we're, you know, we're gonna turn the lights off an hour early, you know, early morning to save that money. You know, we wanna plan for having the full, full budget for those and then, and then to shave, you know, where we can and to be mindful of, of expenses, um, you know, throughout the year. My my final comment is, you know, I'm not sure we look like we're doing the best job by having a $1.2 million reduction, uh, which typically we haven't had. Okay, Charlie, that's my last comment. Oh. Henry, that could have been my comment. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're saying the same thing here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that that's two of us. And I, I saw some other nodding heads here. Um, you know, you guys, uh, city uh, staff here, are looking for us to approve this budget. Um, I don't know how we approve this budget the way it is. All right. I don't know how I vote for it. You know, to me... I would vote for a balanced budget. I would vote for maybe an imbalanced budget if the assumptions were aligned with revenue and expenses, uh, because we're still coming out of the COVID uh, period, uh, you know, in this you know, coming year, we don't know any better. But like Henry just said, I don't know how we can put forward a uh, unbalanced budget going forward, you know, uh, with, knowing that those things are out of whack. Well, why don't so we do this? We can, we can, we can, we can make, make a make motion a proposal, and but... you, we can get a motion to approve. And if it doesn't pass, it's noted. <clears throat> well, okay. Uh, let me ask the board here. Is there anyone that motions to approve this budget? I guess I have a clarifying question here. If we, if we don't approve the budget, what happens then? Uh, it's noted in the minutes. And I guess we would take it back internally and see if there's anything uh, between conversations with the uh, director's office and DOT and the city's budget office and any edits that they may want to make. And so we're making none, a statement if we don't approve it. Charlie, would you like to propose a motion other than approval then for us to consider? Or do we want to vote down approval first? Well, no one's a motion to approve the budget. All right. <laughs> so, you know, that, that it, it's gone unmoved. So, I, you know, you can't second, you can't approve or disapprove. All right. So, you know, Aaron, you know, that to me, the, the budget as it stands, you know, has not been approved by this committee. I can make ball. that note in the minutes. And yes. would you know? Now, now, what I'd recommend, I think this is where David is going here, is you know, I'm very happy to, and, and, I, and I've said it and Henry said it, uh, you know, and others are welcome to, you know, uh, pile on here, but, uh, you know, 
we've said I, I, what we would like to see here. Now it's up to you guys to decide if uh, you want to do that or not. And you want to see a balanced budget. Could, could, and my caveat it, is just that, you know, it, revenues are take, down. With, theoretically, I guess we could take the transfer out and we're, we're balanced. We're actually more positive. Right? So if we didn't fund the capital with the 1.7, then we're 500,000 positive but uh, but i'm still i still have the same issue you're correct mathematically yeah. but i still have the same issue that the assumptions are different between the revenue and the expenses right yep and and I that's think, i think my, my recommendation to... to staff is that we have consistent assumptions yeah and i think council would have to amend every contract that we have to bring those contract values down in order to budget down to an amount that mirrors those contracts because we're not going to have contracts that allow us to spend X, but then a budget that doesn't have that same amount. Or you raise your revenue assumption. Okay, but that seems to me now you're just playing, <laughs> you're just playing numbers. Uh, that, that's what budgeting is, right? <laughs> Well, I, okay, so if we came back and said we were going to raise revenues by 30%, and here's the... So my question is, still stands. Did you go back and check certain things? You know, are you aligned with, you know, the four or five or six major entities that are bringing events in? Yeah. And if you say you are, and they're at 30%, then that's the right number to put in here, or it's it's a better assumption than yeah, being- Yeah, I guess I, I feel like we're being more transparent about how we're doing this by telling you, you know, we're, we're cautious in our revenue streams. We're budgeting based on the full value of our contracts and at the full amount. And if there's savings, which we are going to manage against and towards, absolutely, that's the goal. But we have the flexibility to spend the monies that have been approved to spend versus- yeah, we're going to make 30% more money just so we show something on the books. If we don't make it, we'll come back and tell you that we didn't. But I don't know. That seems a little more disingenuous than the approach that we've taken. I have At a point, comment. I, I have a comment um, really in support of sort of the reasonability of the budget. So it's not entirely uncommon or unheard of in a time of rising costs that we would have expenses rising and revenues decreasing, right? Like, Arian's right, like these are contracts that are made for years. And so it's not uncommon that a contract cost would be increasing when some of our top line assumptions are decreasing, right? We know that fewer people have been going downtown. I'm operating under an assumption that Arian and the team are um, vetting all the inputs for assumptions that they're making for the top line. I guess my question or concern that I would have Arian um, and for the city is just the transfer and how we're coming up with the dollars that we're allocating to the capital budget. Because we, we, ha we have more than a balanced budget outside of the transfer that we're making to the, to the capital. And it, would it be reasonable to reduce that and maybe plan for a larger increase of a transfer to the capital funds in future years when our revenue assumptions are a little bit better? Yeah, the exact amount, I mean, it is, it is, a very rounded $1.77 million. And there are some land acquisition uh, targets and those, are, those have some appraised values as I understand it uh, from the real estate department. And I think that's what is being born in that amount there was to fund some key land acquisitions. So that is why that amount hits next year. The out years in the next table down here are really plug numbers at this point. So our net revenue is 576,000. The, the negative 1.2 is the reduction in the fund balance. Mm -hmm. So just, just to highlight that piece, the, the, the right. budget is positive. Right. We're, we're transact, we're you know, transferring some monies out of, I guess, the ending fund balance. So uh, I think in order to move us forward, given we're more
more than halfway done and we've got quite a few items left. I have noted that the minutes were not approved, that the board would want to see uh, a balanced, balanced budget and uh, and consistent more, assumptions, consistent assumptions, more consistent consistency across assumptions in revenue and expenses. So Blair, we'll get to you in just a second. Be patient. Okay, please. <clears throat> So any other comments from the board members here? Very yeah. good discussion. Thank you. Yeah. So Blair, your, your, your two minutes. Great, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, yeah, I'm not involved in, in, in the economics of issues, but I really like the idea of, of city auditing and what that could work towards. Um, I like uh, that things can be paid for fairly easy through government. But I also really like the idea of balanced budget ideas. And I know Mayor Licardo, when COVID first started, really made it an important point to work towards balanced budget initiatives uh, in, in how we we're going to head into the COVID crisis. It was really, really smart planning of him that I hope can be of some help to yourselves in how you need to navigate things at this time. I don't know where this uh, his work has gone since uh, you know COVID first started. I don't know that so much, but I, I, his initial ideas and inspiration, I think uh, it's important to mention it here at this time, at public comment time. And, and from that, I really learned the importance of, uh, you know, it's important to me to learn how, uh, you know, equity and racial equity, and civil protection ideas with uh, an openness and accountability practices, those really can help organize good balanced budget ideas. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a really good one-two combination if you're having difficulties addressing uh, your, your budgeting concerns at this time to possibly address those issues as a way to uh, help break your current log jam and uh, so I don't know, just ideas from the public at this time. Thanks for your uh, time and patience and uh, good luck in, in balancing the budget and talking to the auditing office and, uh, and, and good people. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. Darian, back to you. Uh, 6A, I believe Heather, you were gonna provide an update. Stop sharing. Oh, Heather, you're on mute. Got it. Apologies. Um, so for this item, we're just going to provide a very brief recap and status update as um, staff continues to work on putting together an updated draft uh, meter reserve structure for the board's consideration. Uh, you may recall that during the September meeting, um, staff provided a report and a presentation on the history and the structure of the existing meter reserves. And then during our last meeting in November, um, we provided a report and a presentation on the potential options um, for consideration for the reserve changes. Um, also at that November meeting, the board provided direction to staff um, requesting that the focus for our further um, work was placed on continuing to evaluate the options and um, opportunities relative to individual or micrometer reserves. Um, so we've, we've started that process. Um, the micro reserves would establish separate reserves for each individual um, kind of meter district in their set boundaries. Uh, we're currently researching the practices used by other city, uh, California cities that have meter reserves. Um, and we've had preliminary conversations with the budget office uh, regarding these micro reserves uh, and the concept. Uh, in order to fully vet the details of the micro reserves, Further discussions will need to occur with the budget office as well as the city attorney's office and city administration. So once that is completed, uh, staff will um, anticipate coming back to provide a potential recommendation for the board's consideration. Um, as we previously mentioned, um, due to the financial status of the parking operating fund and the capital fund, um, estimate where a city's estimating that potential funds um, for funding reserves in the future um, will probably not be available until after the next fiscal year. So there's still a lot of time to um, work on this um, reserve um, uh, 
structure and um, move through with um, any kind of council approvals and whatnot that we have to get for it. So um, stay tuned and we will come back to you with a formal um, kind of proposal um, in the near future for your consideration. Thanks, Heather. Mm -hmm. 6B. Downtown residential parking, Elias, were you gonna present, present that? Yeah, so this is basically an informational memo um, uh, to uh, put in writing what has been uh, discussed uh, last meeting. It outlines the availability of residential parking in downtown through our four garages where there is an, uh, a residential parking program. And it also... Uh, gives you an idea about the number of public uh, parking meters available in those areas and the restrictions around them. They're basically available after 6 p.m., uh, between 6 p.m. and 9 a.m. And uh, in some uh, entertainment zones, there is uh, some restrictions on overnight parking. But uh, I don't know if anyone has any question about it. Bill, did you want to weigh in on this? Uh, it seems like the board is uh, quiet on this right now. So go ahead, Bill. Yeah, uh, I'll start out by saying I really don't understand what Elias just described. Um, so maybe in, in uh, uh, layman's terms for citizens who are impacted by it, what does this mean? What does it change? I think- and, well, yeah, I think we are articulating the, the various options in the downtown core that the city currently has available to downtown residents would include parking in our city facilities. And on street we, no, but, but, but the, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about uh, on street parking. Okay, so on, yeah, and so it's just articulating the existing ecosystem of on street meters and the various restrictions that come with those. There is no and, proposed change. This is okay. The, so, so uh, residential parking permits are not uh, aligned with this at all. Correct. There is no. I'm oh, sorry. Um, the this uh, the board asked us to come back after our discussion at our last meeting. Um, where we explain kind of the residential parking program and as it exists in the city. Um, and then we explain the various um, options available to residents in the downtown. Um, the board asked us to come back and memorialize that residential um, parking option piece, which is what Elias has done in this informational memo. It just outlines these are options that residents in the downtown have to um, accommodate parking um, in these various facilities and, and the options available to them through the city and, and outside of city um, lots, garages and on-street parking. So this doesn't touch on the existing residential permit parking that um, the city has in areas outside of the downtown. And my request from October, which was to evaluate whether or not uh, residential parking permits would be appropriate uh, during this time of dramatic change for downtown core residents was um, refused, I guess. Is that what this summary says? Sorry, I'm having trouble with my mute button. Um, that was not the direction that we received from the board. So um, we did what the board asked us to do, which was come back with this informational memo. Um, and at that meeting, we had kind of explained the limitations and what the RPP program currently exists of. Heather, um, maybe I can provide some, some context. Um, and, and Bill, you probably don't know me, Laura Wells, Assistant Director for the Department of Transportation. Um, the city has, um, I believe, 22 permit zones, residential permit zones throughout the city and various 
locations um, that are intended and structured to address um, neighborhoods that have excessive parking demands, either from intrusion or local excessive parking demands. Can I can I just can I just add right there, Laura, just to be very clear where I'm coming from, the residents in the downtown core are probably more impacted by excessive parking demand than any other part of the population. That's all that's the only reason I'm here. Right, right, right. So so in in developing and and operating and having a residential permit parking program, when we um, Historically, they have been intrusion-based, San Jose State Arena, near, near high intrusion-based locations. About five years ago, we were um, asked by council to look at a program where there is excessive demand from, from, from the residents internally within, within a, a neighborhood. And in developing that alternate um, program, what we became aware of is an attorney general opinion, California attorney general opinion um, in 20, I believe it was 2016 or 17 that says, you know, cities can have res implement residential permit parking, but we can't distinguish based upon the type of dwelling it is, or we can't say this, these categories of residents can get permits, but these ca other categories can't. Um, and any, you know, so if we were to look at having a program in the downtown at meter districts where residents could have a permit, it would apply to all of the residents. And then we would also all the other areas where we have meter districts, we would have, we can't have a program in one meter district and then say, oh, well, but this meter district isn't eligible. So if we're now going to have a program in the downtown for downtown residents, all downtown residents would be eligible to get permits to park on street. And that would be counter to the intent of the on-street parking, which is to provide turnover for visitors coming to visit various businesses downtown. If I may, mm -hmm. the strategy, the stated strategy of the Department of Transportation in San Jose is to reduce parking availability in downtown for uh, ecological reasons and uh, uh, traffic uh, uh, reduction. So that is counter to uh, having a, a meter strategy where you want a lot of people turning over in car traffic uh, all the time. So I'm just pointing out that that is, those two things are mutually exclusive. The second thing is, um, I don't understand why I walk around the streets of San Francisco and every single metered area has an exception for uh, permit B, permit A, permit C. And that's because those are such high demand parking areas and they are protecting their residents. I don't know how else to ask for the ability to park my car on my street during a Sharks game, a concert, uh, other activities going on all around the city. Uh, so I just I just don't understand the logic in that. And if you're telling me no, then I guess that's it. But I got to tell you, the people that live in the dense area in the downtown core are the ones that are embracing the long term um, uh, uh, transit centric urban village concept. And it feels like we're being penalized for that uh, because we don't have the ability to have people come and park near us for dinner or stay overnight as guests or park our second vehicle, which uh, we don't have a space for in the reduced parking residential areas. I don't know how else to say it, 
It just doesn't seem fair. Charlie pointed out it's a, you know, my personal responsibility for choosing to have a second car. I get all of that, but it still just seems to me like there'd be a simple way to do it. I'm, I pay P bid. I'm a registered homeowner. My vehicle is registered to that P bid paying address. There certainly could be a way to have a limited method of providing that sort of parking permit. That's all I'm suggesting. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the type of person you want living downtown. And I don't think you want to make it suck to live downtown, to be honest, but you kind of are. And if, if that's what it is, that's what it is, then I just deal with it and uh, maybe start looking for a different city. Hey, Bill, it's Henry. What, um, so on the city side, they would expect the loss of revenue. How can we make up the difference? Uh, would homeowners like yourself be willing to pay for that on street parking? I put in a comment when uh, Arian and Charlie were having their robust dialogue, and that is that the overarching strategy is to reduce incoming traffic to the city. Therefore, by doing it by reducing uh, parking availability, one way to reduce parking availability is to turn it back to the people that actually live there need to park their car to unpack their groceries, all of that kind of stuff. By the way, remember, new residences are not going to be required to have any parking. So if the, if the people that are following the, the, uh, the vision of dense living downtown are going to be the one that bear the brunt of parking because uh, we want to make money from the people that only come into downtown for Sharks games, that doesn't sound like a a uh, a fair way to treat tax paying San Jose residents, in my opinion. I don't know if that answers your question, Henry. Well, I was just getting on the revenue side of it. I'm I'm sympathetic with most. A lot of families need two cars. Yes, and by the way, on the revenue side, just look at those numbers. Most of the expense for this uh, for this budget goes into paying for managing the parking. It's, there's no benefit. You throw off a million dollars of revenue that's beneficial to the city, M me as a resident of the city, a million bucks uh, out of twelve million dollars of revenue. So quite frankly, I'm not sure that it's worth it. Talk to small businesses who are struggling to have people come into their shops um, and people don't come downtown because it costs too much to park. All of these things are in play. Long-term, we, we want to reduce car traffic. Long-term, we want this to be a people-centric location. People that live downtown are not the ones that are driving up and down the street looking for a parking spot. We're the ones that park our car and we're here all day. Anyway, I would like to think that it's a, a more nuanced problem to solve and take into account all of the things that you're trying to accomplish and um, uh, to shoot it down now in the midst of this a significant change over the next decade just seems, I don't know, lazy. Bill, um, from what I understand, a lot of the parking permit programs exist for neighborhoods that don't have access to garages. They've outlined that you have an access to garages. You happen to own an oversized vehicle that doesn't fit in the garages. That's like having an RV in downtown. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm stop, so sorry. Stop, stop. Tomiko, if you're going to talk about the height of my vehicle, I don't want to talk about that. 
talk about me, talk about me having my little smart car and I get home from work at 6 p.m. on a shark's night, you're not reserving me a spot in the garage. You're, I'm competing with hundreds of people lined up to get into that garage. But we do accommodate our permit holders. <clears throat> it's, it's part of our operational model is to ensure that we, that we reserve some level of spaces for the permit holders that may show up. So how many? I don't have a specific number, but we utilize the, the data on how many permit holders are typically in a garage during a, a time of day to ensure that we have space. If you're a frequent user of any of our garages, I can't remember many times within the last nearly 20 years I've been around downtown that we've put out a lot full and would not accommodate a permit holder. Now we've re restricted access in some very limited times to visiting parkers that may try to pull a ticket, but that's even infrequent. The, the Market Street garage is full on a Sharks game. It just is. It, it may have been full to those that wanted to buy a ticket for that three hour period of time, but to the owner of a restaurant that wanted to come to work that night that had a monthly permit, we would accommodate them. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank I you guess that's the end of, end of subject, right? The fact that I pay PBID and live right downtown in this, our largest um, urban village with two cars and, and one spot, that's my, that's my problem. I think we've articulated where the options lie. Residential permit parking is not one of them at the moment. Okay. City operated garages would welcome you. I'm sure there's private garages that may be more proximate that would be open to permitted parking. And then the existing on-street infrastructure with its limitations of time restrictions. Maybe I should move, maybe I should move over to the Delmas neighborhood, right? I won't debate where you should or shouldn't go. I think we should move on to item okay. 6C, if that's okay with you, Charlie. Bill, yes, it absolutely is. Bill, thank you. Uh, Aaron, well done. Uh, okay, 6C. 6C is a, is a memo uh, outlining our intention to sunset the subsidized and free clean air vehicle parking program that's been on the books for, oh gosh, going on. 20 plus years at this point. There's a program built upon kind of trying to boost up and um, drive clean air vehicle ownership. And we feel that the, the time is right now with the kind of maturing of that market to sunset that program and transition to utilizing any increased funding that may come from that to build the infrastructure for the electric vehicles that we know are coming. I'll be open to any, com any comments or questions. Could I, could I jump in quickly? Um, Arian, um, when we wandered around, I said, what's going on with those EVs? And you told me, if I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, that if you have a, whatever the cost of the Tesla is, you could, under this program, you could park in our garages free all day long and charge your car. Correct. And I think my reaction to that was, this is nuts. And um, I think what I'm hearing you say is that this is a proposal to change that program. It's a, basically a proposal to eliminate that program. So if you owned a Tesla, you would be required to buy a monthly permit if you were so inclined to work downtown. Or you get uh, your 90 minutes free and then you'd pay. Correct. And then my last yeah. question is, uh, how long can a, a one of the, e how, how long can you leave your car at one of the, how is it managed the, the putting of a car to a, a space? In an electric vehicle space? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Well, currently we have signage that says that you should be actively charging, which is required. You have to be plugged in uh, and we can, I would say can, I don't know how actively we are doing that currently at the moment, but we can enforce some uh, use of that charger that you have to be actively charging. You can't leave it there for 12 hours and have charged for one hour, but admittedly that's, that's a difficult task for the enforcement officers to walk right. around and check Got every it. charger in the city. Got it. And my, my couple other quick questions. So um, uh, the EV charging system, I'm learning about this stuff. It's so many miles per minute or something like that is, is how you charge. So if, if some of these, if you have a 120 volt thing, it's seven miles maybe it's per hour. And, and that means that it would take, you know, 10 hours to charge 70 miles. And that's horrible. Do you have any idea what the charging um, specs are for ours? Are they all I the think same? Almost all of ours are what they call level two chargers. So it's basically like a 220, like your, your dryer, like you, like the charger one would install at their home. Uh, okay. So it's significantly faster, but it's not intended to be necessarily a you know super fast a super fast charger it's absolutely not and the city is actively pursuing and conversating with vendors that have interest in bringing those types of chargers to our facilities um a they're they are expensive and there's a lot of electrical infrastructure that goes into those but uh, the city's of, goal is obviously to bring that kind of infrastructure right couple not just other, to downtown but all over yeah. A couple of, do, do we buy these from a vendor and own them? The chargers themselves? Yes, sir. Yeah. So the city buys the chargers. Uh, charge point is the city's vendor currently. So the customer users then sign up for their own account through that and pay the associated fees. The city sets the, the charging fees per kilowatt hour or whatever it is um, on a cost recovery basis only. So every year they go back and say, how much did we spend in electricity R and M of the units themselves and any contractual costs for the charge point chargers and then sets that for the charging rate. So charge point is our, our uh, vendor basically. Correct. And uh, do we pay the cost of the capital cost to put them in? Yes. And then charge point is like the, it's sort of like SP parking then in a way. And, and they are our vendor, and then they manage the process of people paying and the like. Mm -hmm. yep. And yep. then we make no money off of this. Correct. Is anything in this proposal talk about trying to make some money off of this? Uh, it would be the elimination of the free parking. So this doesn't really touch on the actual vehicle charging in and of itself. This speaks more to, because right now, if you had a qualified vehicle and you had one of the permits, there's nothing that says you have to go park in one of those electric vehicle charging spaces. You can go park anywhere in any one of our facilities or at any meter in the downtown and park for free. So wow. this, this has nothing to do with actually charging your vehicle and only a, a goal that the city had to spur the, the adoption. Early adoption. The, the vehicle. I understand why you did it. Um, so, so we have a con is it an annual contract with Charge Point to do this? Uh, no, I don't know how long our contract is. I don't manage that contract directly myself, and I oh. think maybe you're we're kind of there's two branches. Yeah, there's two of parts the, of the puzzle. Yeah. Well, uh, I I got lots of more questions. You you told me, and I don't have it in front of me, how many EV spaces we have. It's only in our facilities, like sixty or something. Mm -hmm. It's, it's more than that. I want to say it's actually, I think it's in the memo. Uh, da, 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 da. I didn't see it. Uh, I swore I put that in there. Did I not? 104 charging stations in city lots. There you go. Um, so I have no other questions. I'll defer to others, but I'm willing to move to do this right away because I think this is a fabulous idea. So maybe I'm alone. Was that a motion? I have a, little, I have a little fun fact since we looks like we have some time. So when I first came into the parking program back in 2001, 
I was responsible for proposing that we have the program <laughs> to, and at that time it was, it was um, free parking for primarily hybrids, but also EVs. Um, it was really fun when we um, canceled the program for basic level hybrids, when I got a letter from myself saying I could no longer park um, using the clean air permit. Um, this makes sense to eliminate it. The whole purpose for why we established the program 20 years ago was to incentivize the, the buying of the technology. It's, it's not needed right now. I love that endorsement. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so we have 20 minutes to run through any other of these last items. If there's any other questions, we could take them. I know we have a public comment that we can move. Are we supposed to move this item forward? I mean, well, before I'm going, we, before we do, I, I, we need to hear Blair's comment on this. Yeah, I would like to hear other comments. Yeah. yeah. So All before right. we go to Blair, I'm sorry, is there any other board comments on this? No. Go ahead, Blair. Okay. All right. Thank you for allowing uh, public comment uh, for this item. I think, uh, you know, you guys want to hurry up the meeting. I understand. I do. I would like like to speak on this item specifically so thank you um i'm just learning you know the importance that we're kind of in a new stage of what can be uh good renewable energy practices and we're kind of in a new stage of addressing uh a push by the fossil fuel industry in california that they really want to put their mark on uh how we practice our economy now and for the next few years and I think, interestingly, we were discovering that we don't have to work that way. Those are old economic models. We actually can continue to work towards, uh, you know, uh, more productive, more creative and interesting renewable energy ideas at this time. And in fact, why I think Russia personally is having a problem because <laughs> they're so locked in their own fossil fuel world, they can't see a, a more flexible vision of how to you know, work their ideas of what should be a more peaceful area in the future of the Ukraine. So I, I think renewables are incredibly important at this time. I think we can say no uh, again to the fossil fuel industry. And I think that means to, I think we're at a time we have to reconsider incentive ideas for, you know, I hope it's not just Tesla that's, that's getting uh, privileges for electric car charging, but everyone with electric cars can, can get some sort of privilege still. And it's not, it's not to lock us out of that at this time. It's how to uh, better promote it still and, and to, to consider uh, what can be new options as we're, as we're entering a new phase of, uh, I don't know, just regularity of, of, of renewable energy ideas. Uh, I, I think there can be good practices to continue to promote those renewable ideas. And I hope we can work towards that. And uh, it's definitely the way that can help us out of any natural disaster worries in the next few years with good ideals uh, now that we practice. Thank you. Thank you, Blair, for your comments. Thank you. Arian, back to you, sir. 7A, I do not have any update there. I don't have anything uh, to share other than kind of the stuff that I had mentioned about the, the lot E kind of real estate uh, yeah acquisitions that the the city is moving towards so i don't have anything else to add there and i know Marian, do you need the board to vote i didn't hear if it voted oh, shoot. On the yeah we, we zipped right past that so if i could get a i move motion. that we approve this <laughs> second <laughs> all right uh all in favor aye aye yes <laughs> unanimous okay right. well done Thank you. um seven b i know nathan uh, Olsh is here with the Downtown Association and was had some information to share with us. Yeah, I promise you don't have to read all the text. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Beautiful. All right. Good morning, board. Thank you, Erin. Heather, uh, Laura, uh, here to give a quick report out. So there's massive text. I could send this out to folks. It's about four pages, but I'm going to hit some key highlights as we go through. So part of the budgeting, I was listening to that. Uh, some of the funds that are going, coming to SJDA is to fund the marketing efforts to get people downtown. And ideally, there'd be a return on investment on that. So theoretically, the revenue would increase by virtue yeah. of a transfer out here. Um, but the objective here, increase uh, revenue parking activity in the city facilities um, and increase the customer experiences that are they're, uh, coming downtown for events and so forth. So a big caveat, obviously, um, the pandemic, ah. we saw uh, a drop a significant Man. Um, decrease with now an increase coming back online with events and so forth. Um, we are actually also getting some estimates on upgrading the platform 
in the usage on our website as folks are going more, more mobile. Uh, we want to be able to update that and also include uh, some further pictures really to, de to depict where and how people can park uh, through that. So we have some stats here, won't go through that. Um, also, we uh, had to update some items on the website. It's um, indicated in a couple different spots, but there was some confusion, I think, between what was happening at the events and specifically, you know, after 6 p.m. events happening. So the special rate versus the free 90 minutes. Uh, I did want to clarify that with folks here that we did um, send this information out multiple times to let people know because we were hearing some inquiries about why and how, et cetera, um, that was happening. Um, kept folks abreast of what was happening and where to park for uh, special events and street closures and so forth. Um, and that's Nathan, very just important. real quick on, on yeah. that, on those inquiries about the kind of the disconnect between a special event charge and not being able to benefit from the 90 minutes free is, is no different than when we had the validation program for, for decades, that the validation was also not accepted. So customers coming in expecting to just pull a ticket and go to dinner and get a validation uh, oh. were also not uh, kind of betting fitting from just just level setting everybody's like, well, this is totally new and not unexpected. Is that you know the the discounted or free element of parking just the, the mechanism changed, but the people's expectations should have been pretty much the same. That if there is a special event, they were expecting. Okay. Yeah, there was uh, just yeah. with businesses coming online or new businesses yeah. coming in, they didn't know what they didn't know. So we had a, a bit of an educational component to that um, as we're coming back online. That's predominantly what it was. Most people understood it, but there was just some confusion of, okay, we're going 90 minutes free versus validation and in what garages this is happening in and so forth. And so um, it was just new programming, new elements coming online and uh, clarification more than anything. Not so much complaints, um, if that, that makes sense. Um, we did share out, we do a blog post um, as well. So I'm gonna pepper some pretty pictures in here as well. Um, and just to let uh, council know, but also the constituents. Um, so folks can send this out to their uh, members of the community, let them know, hey, this is what's going on downtown. Um, this is actually just as important um, in regards to uh, getting photos out there, but letting folks know that uh, during holiday seasons, and I'll get to it a little bit later, events that are occurring downtown, farmers markets, downtown ice, et cetera, that those uh, my go-to spot graphics are updated and in the parking garages um, to let keep folks abreast of what's happening, where and why and where to park uh, accordingly. Um, skip through some of this. Um, once again, continuing uh, to push out the 90 minute free parking specifically when it uh, first launched, but continuing that through our downtown or onliner. Uh, we have a couple different ways that we send information out, obviously social media, uh, gets a lot of people, but we also have um, our online presence through our uh, e-newsletter. We have a couple of those that we blast out as well to thousands of people throughout. Um, big thing too is we have our uh, businesses uh, downtown. We have uh, a thousand plus members, uh, businesses downtown that we want to send this information to. A lot of them have posted this on their uh, specific websites or they have it internally hanging on a wall. Um, you know, we hand out flyers and so forth. Um, as a physical copy, along with online presence um, there. Um, just want to make sure that, you know, we are promoting the downtown events when they're happening and rotating out the graphics accordingly. So when we are looking at the uh, parking console, you'll see different types of uh, visuals uh, present in the parking garages and so forth. A lot of these hopefully look familiar to you um, as, as we ran through several of these marketing campaigns and so forth. Um, I'll skip that one for now. I know we're running out of time here. Um, but uh, yeah, the big thing uh, that we're also looking at doing is we've been trying to figure out how do we leverage current events with future events and getting folks downtown. So part of it is getting the parking uh, structures filled, but also other modes of transportation. So anytime people bring, um, they present us with a, a card, ridership card, if you will, we try to give them an incentive to come down to the farmer's market, visit, et cetera, but also uh, having folks when they park it uh, second in, in San Carlos, which is the closest to the farmer's market since it moved. Um, but we also say any parking garage. So if you happen to go to San Pedro and want to walk down, that's equally received. Uh, we'll give them a uh, market carrot cash um, by virtue of doing that. So apart from that, we have APTs. Those are our public uh, toilets downtown that we have. And um, 
as the mask mandates come off today, um, yesterday, today, uh, we are doing a, a revamp of our membership process. And we have uh, currently hired somebody uh, a few months back to look at our programming and essentially our information that we're handing out to folks. So we're going to do a uh, refresher, if you will, to our downtown community. Uh, once again, make sure folks have the pamphlets, um, the right information to be able to put online uh, for further presence. Uh, and then we talk about this also through our advocacy efforts, um, letting folks know in local media interviews, we make little plugs specifically when we're talking about farmer's market, dine downtown, um, and so forth to say, hey, remember, you can park downtown for free 90 minutes um, at any of the uh, city parking garages and so forth. So I'll pause there. I can send this out um, here to answer any questions you all might have. Thank you, Nathan. Any uh, comments, questions on Nathan's uh, talk? I have a, a quick comment and um, I wouldn't be opposed if you added our business to that list with Orange Theory and Wesca for whatever it's worth, Nathan, you know us well. Um, yes, I do. And the, uh, the other comment is for whatever, uh, um, oh, that's nice, Orange Theory. Um, the, uh, <laughs> Not to put your competition up. That, uh, <laughs> you should know is that if, at some point there, right when the shark season started, if you pulled into the garage at, well, I can't say, say the parking started at the $10 started at five. If you pulled in at 4.30, um, you had to pull out by 4.59 or you got charged. And we didn't know that. And our customers got hit with $6 or $10 fees because we weren't aware of it. So if y'all going to do that again, and I think you've changed that now back to the old program, which is if you get in before the $10 people are standing there collecting money that you can stay for your 90 minutes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if when you all, y'all make these changes, it'd be great if you let us know, because we were not aware of it. And one of the people that had to pay $6 was my wife and she was not very happy. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll David's there. not happy. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Uh, any other comments on this? Well, I hope David, David reimbursed his wife. And hey, Nathan, do you mind? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Blair, could you put your hand down unless this is a new comment that you're making? Uh, just to keep uh, the order of things here. Thank you. Um, and then uh, we're on 7C now. Yeah, just uh, I had my team send me a couple of the outdoor special events that are coming down the pipe, um, which is a good sign that these things are coming back. You know, we've got the Shamrock Run 5K and 10K uh, on March 12th. There's a large public dance at the convention center um, on March 26th. They've, I think, only had one other, maybe two um, in the last, and those were fairly recent, I think just back in like November or something um, in the last two years. So that's a positive sign. Um, we've got two Viva Calles happening, one May 1st and one June 12th. Uh, so my team's working hard on those, of course, the, uh, the arena events. Um, that's, that's what I've got from a special event perspective on my radar at the moment. All right. City council agenda items. So there's two items I wanted to, to comment on first being, we continued last meeting. We brought forward the parking permit agreement program. We're still finalizing the framing of that for city council. We expect that to go in spring, um, given its um, leanings towards um, targeting commercial real estate as the, the target for those parking agreements. We're, we're calling it the commercial real estate parking program. Um, so we expect that to go to council sometime in, in the spring, hopefully by sometime in April. I suspect now at this point, we're, we're starting to hit April instead of March. Um, but that'll include some cleanup of the master parking rate schedule, which will include the sunsetting of the uh, EV uh, car program, as well as some other uh, parking programs. The other thing is everybody's uh, seen and known that the San Pedro Street has been closed throughout the pandemic for outdoor dining and continues to be so. I know the city not our team specifically, but other teams within the city are continuing to evaluate what the future of that closure, does it become permanent? Um, 
with those conversations, myself and the team uh, thought it would be good to fully understand what the impacts to the Market Street garage would be if that San Pedro Street were permanently closed because it does contain two of our uh, four entry lanes. Uh, we've maintained the San Pedro Street exit so we still can exit either onto San Pedro and go north or onto Market Street and go south. Um, but the San Pedro side entrance has been closed. So if San Pedro does, what would that look like? We engaged Hexagon Transportation Consultants to do an analysis of what does that look like long term. They have concluded the summarization of their analysis and we provided them kind of pre-pandemic data on activity in the garages. And they concluded that the garage would be able to accommodate entries and exits uh, during kind of Monday through Friday, AM, PM peak uh, traffic. So that'd be your morning ingress commute and evening egress uh, without significant delays. Uh, but they did note, and not surprisingly, that during event prepay, so that kind of evening Sharks game that we would have some, some backup. We've had backup throughout the years, even when we had four lanes, it would just be slightly longer delays um, when we're only using San Pedro. We see those today, um, even with some of the lower attended events, but we'd expect that to continue ongoing and we'd have to work through some operational improvements to try and mitigate that to the extent possible where we expect there to be some delays in entering uh, if San Pedro were to be closed permanently. So we expect that that would be kind of all encompassing in the analysis if the city does bring forward some recommendation long-term to maintain San Pedro as a closed street. And that's all I've got on the, the horizon. All right. Uh, any other comments on the board uh, for the meeting here today? I, I'd just like to go back to the Market Street garage. Arian, when did you think, I know the Downtown Association is very interested in seeing uh, the chain uh, closed. Uh, do you have an idea from anybody uh, when uh, a decision may be made? I, I do not. I know the attorneys are evaluating with, I think, the Office of Economic Development what, what needs to transpire to close a public street. Uh, evidently, it's not as easy as just saying we're going to close it. There's, there's quite a, a process, but I am, I am not. I'm peripherally involved as a stakeholder, if you will, operating the garage, but not directly involved in the the, the push of that. Understood, thanks. Yeah, Henry, I could chime in a little bit. Um, we are working with the stakeholders there, the property owners and the business owners. We're trying to get a consensus on if it if it will go through. To Arian's point, there is some legal lease that needs to be discovered in terms of, can you close a public right of way indefinitely, et cetera. And so there are um, some, some uh, research that needs to be done on that front, but yeah. Um, and then likewise, we want to make sure, you know, y'all saw post street reopen recently as well um, because of um, some feedback that we heard from the, from the community. So same thing applies to San Pedro uh, as well. Thanks. But I did have a quick, um, I do want to uh, make a plug for the defense of our hundred thousand. Um, not that I need to, I, I hope not, but um, as well, uh, the ice rink, I believe it was asked what the uh, request was for the hundred K and for the repairs. Um, we are going to be making some updates to the ice rink uh, next year, um, hopefully as well. And so the rink design, uh, but the improvements, fixing the, the entryway uh, for folks to get through, install new ramps, security railing, pedestrian gates, and relocation of restrooms. And so we want to make it more uh, enticing, I will say, for visitors, or visitors to park and walk down to the area and have an actual entryway. Um, this year is a little funky uh, for a couple of different reasons, but that's going to be where the improvements are going to be focused on. Right. Thank you, Nathan. Blair, bring us home, buddy. All right. Last, last comment. Thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a big one I got here. So thank you. Uh, I, my last public comment at the end, I, uh, 
I, I mentioned the uh, concept of, of preparing for natural disaster practices. And I, it was a weird thing to add at the end. I, I hope I didn't throw anybody off. But it's just been my concern that uh, uh, we, we may have to be preparing ourselves for, you know, a wildfire and earthquake and sea level rise uh, in the Bay Area and San Jose in the next few years. And I just wanted to mention at this time, just so we can be open and aware of the subject, I don't really know what's going to be happening in the next few years, but if I say this openly, I think it can help start to create the idea of better choices for ourselves and a better uh, community environment for conversation about the subjects. And uh, so thanks for that. And, and it's from that that, uh, you know, I think we're practicing renewable energy ideas at this time with the specific purpose of um, if we are headed towards some sort of major natural disaster, it's, it's, it's re our renewable ideas that can help pull us out of uh, any future natural disasters. We're going to need a bit of fossil fuels during the time of a natural disaster, but to get out of that period, it is a return to our good ideals and our renewable ideals. So it's like people want to practice those things now. And I think that's an awesome strategy and an awesome way to, to view, you know, the fossil fuel debate that's happening between that and, and renewable energy. And I feel if, if uh, Putin in Russia took this same creative ideas and, and, and way of looking at this situation, he would, he would be making different choices about how to address the future of peace for that region that I think we all want to address. So um, good luck on renewable energy ideas and, and that we can still work on creative models with renewables at this time, uh, good luck in, in, in those budgeting matters. Thank you. Thank you, Blair, for yep. your comments. And uh, with that, uh, Arian, I think I we just, can uh, close out the meeting. We can. One last thing I wanted to, to bring forward is there's uh, some internal staffing wanted to see if there'd be an openness to move the June meeting from June 1st to June 8th. June 1st is on the tail end of, I think, Memorial Day weekend. Um, it's the Wednesday after. If, if there was some openness to that, we would love to just push that meeting one week. Otherwise, we can, we can stand firm with the June 1st. Fine with it. Yeah, it's David, fine. Sarah, Charlie, how would that work for you? Uh, the 8th, you wanted to do it? Yeah. yeah I, I, I can't do it on the 8th. Okay. You're welcome to do without me. If, if, if it works for everybody else, I can uh, hand the reins back to Henry for a meeting. <laughs> so I'm perfectly fine with that, guys. So if the eighth is better for everybody, and I respect staff's request. Uh, that, if David, that works, then I... David would handle it, not me. Well, okay. just for... It, yeah, just for nostalgic oh, David, purposes. <laughs> yeah, you're on mute. David, we can't hear you. See, he would make an excellent chair. Charlie, <laughs> thank you very much. Charlie, are you not available that whole week or just no, that no, one no, day? Just, just the day, the 8th. I have Is a there meeting. a possibility to do it on the Tuesday or the Thursday then? Tuesday would work fine for me. Since we're moving it, I don't see why we couldn't move it. Okay, how about how's that for a recovery on my part? Thank you very much. <laughs> Henry, he just didn't want you to be the leader again. I don't know. <laughs> I want to see David perform. Well, should we push till, how about the, the ninth? Looks wide open for me, Heather, Elias, any objection there? Um, and hopefully, I'm not sure what the city's gonna do, but this might be in person at that point. And I'm not sure if they'll have hybrid meetings or if it'll just be in person. And? I would prefer the, the Tuesday, but. Tuesday the 7th? The 7th, yeah. yeah. I, that, that's best for me. All right, Tuesday, 6-7. Confirm. I'll change an up Outlook thing just to hold people's calendars for that, that day. So the next meeting will be June 7th at 10 a.m. Uh, Sarah is not available on 6-7. Oh, I'm... I just see that in the, in the chat, so. We also have the option if you wanted to push it to the 15th, the following Wednesday. We were keeping on a Wednesday thinking that would be helpful to everybody, but... 15th is okay with me. Is that better? 
I'm seeing, it looks like that might be better. June 15th. Dara, are you okay with the 15th? You're our, yep, 15th it is. Oh, All right. June 15th. Just cross out. Blair, you're okay with the 15th? Yeah, thanks. All right, very good. All right, then we got a quorum. All right, well done. All right. Guys. Everyone the have a before. good uh, couple of months here and stay safe and uh, frequent the downtown, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody.